and welcome to Community Services on Tuesday, January 19th. We'll call the meeting to order. Uh, we do not have a quorum, so we cannot approve our meeting minutes and agenda. But any comments or questions before we proceed? John, any uh, public comment? I'll remove the cap, sorry. No, no, no comments. Okay. And on to staff reports. Amy. Ann Ann is here if you wanted to approve the minutes. Oh, hi, Ann. We have enough now. Okay, so we'll back up. And is there a motion to approve our minutes and agenda? So moved. And a second. All right, we got to move for motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, we are officially approved. It's so now on to staff reports. Yes. Yeah. So happy new year. It's the first time we've been able to meet in 2021. So happy new year to everybody. Hopefully 2020 will be something far off in our memory in our memories. Hopefully 2021 will be a much better year for, for everybody. Um, I wanted just to give everybody an update where you know all of our facilities are at right now. Um, you know, we kind of just came out of uh, another layer of restrictions. And so once again, we're kind of pivoting and kind of reopening things up. Um, Woodlake is allowed to do programming outdoors, small group social distance, and they are um, renting skis and snow shoes. Uh, maybe not skis today, but normally, yes. So we have a really crafty registration system. So we only check out like a dozen equipment at a time. Everything's pre-registered and um, very close to contactless. So it's nice. And uh, at the ice arena, we have been back to practices for almost a week and a half. And then at last Thursday, we just started opening it back up to games. So that's exciting. Um, there's a lot of mitigation at ice arenas across the state, but one thing different with this rollout as opposed to other times we've opened it up with COVID is every arena across the state is kind of adhering to the same COVID plan. So I think one of the things that, you know, caused issues before is, you know, one arena in Bloomington wasn't doing what we're doing and Ego was doing something different and really teams move all around the metro to play different teams so people would show up and be like i'm not wearing a mask and other people like you're wearing a mask and it just led to a lot of issues so i think now that everyone has one cohesive covid plan across the state um hopefully that will be a best practice and work a lot better so we are busy at the ice arena though a lot of teams that haven't been playing and just open skates been very busy um people are very eager to get ice time and get back to playing. The community center and Woodlake are still closed to the public. Um, and most of the staff at the community center has been focused on uh, some virtual recreation and then self-guided programming. So we're just starting to work on a, a Valentine's, self-guided Valentine's hike. Um, and we're uh, getting ready for tax preparation with seniors. Um, there's some annual programs where We'll be able to do in some capacity so that's nice um our ice skating rinks opened up our warming houses are not open but skating is open which is nice and we are renting out one hockey rink at donaldson to the teams as um, they turn in covid plans and get them approved we can rent ice uh, we also have been doing a lot of sustainability related um, items. Um, the biggest is we're working on organized collection right now with haulers. Um, and that's an ongoing daily, weekly thing. And our hope is that we'll be um, putting together a proposal with haulers that we'll be bringing forward to the council. Um, and then they'll ultimately decide kind of what direction to go with it. Um, but we've been working on organized collection. And we also wrapped up our grant from Hennepin County. We had a grant called Save the Summer Grant. And you might remember we did a lot of different things with the funds that we received. 
Um, some of the highlights were um, free soccer camp for kids. We had free fishing clinics, uh, virtual programming. A lot of the people we brought on for the virtual programs were free. Um, it helped fun for the, the editing of the videos and any equipment we needed for that, we paid through the grant. Uh, we were able to fund uh, over 100 kids to run the Urban Wildland 5K. Uh, all sorts of programming was uh, free through the program, so that's exciting. And kind of one of the last public things we did with the program that was more of a program was the uh, Holiday Lights Parade, which some of you maybe came out and enjoyed. So we're already thinking, how could we incorporate that into our event schedule for 2021? Um, so that's been just an awesome thing that we had the opportunity to to have in 2020 was the, the Save the Summer grant. It um, helped definitely in a tough year to kind of overcome the financial barrier of a lot of programs. And then some of the materials we got for the programs we'll be able to have for many, many years to come, like snowshoes, um, all this equipment we're able to check out. And um, so... But one, two things that we were able to get that we should be implementing more into 2021 is hammock stations. So we have two hammock stations. They're kind of a triangle design that we configured. And so it's really popular, I would say, with like 12 year olds through kind of young adults to go hammock with your friends. So it's one way they can enjoy the outdoors, social distance, and just kind of hang out. Um, so those will be going into, one will go into Woodlake Nature Center, and then the second one is kind of yet to be determined where that one will go. But we're excited to get those out in parks this, hopefully, late spring. And then lastly, we are already starting to look towards summer. It's a little bit of a question mark with COVID, the restrictions, but I think in some capacity, we'll be able to open up the pool this summer. So we're trying to plan for what that might look like and what the staffing needs will be. Um, and also just summer programming in the parks, bringing that back with, with mitigation. And, and it's hard to know the exact restrictions and guidelines at that time, but we are hopeful that we'll bring it, be able to bring back a lot of normalcy um, to our programming this summer. So. I think some of it will probably have to have free registration just to kind of control numbers, but I do think we'll be able to open things back up um, in some capacity. So it'll be really nice. We're looking forward to that. Cool. Yeah. Any questions? Joe? Um, how about the band shell? Are we looking to utilize, you know, what are our plans to utilize that since we invested so much into it last, you know, last yeah, year? Yeah, so right now we are taking tentative, like, bookings for the band shell. Um, and we're kind of putting together, I know John's helping a lot with it, um, kind of a rental agreement. And we'll have something similar for the band shell. Like, if you want to rent a pavilion, there'll be, like, a, a COVID guideline sheet for people that rent it. There'll also be something similar for the band shell if people want to use it for concerts, um, things like that. But I think we will be able to use it this summer um, in some capacity. I think, yes, we're planning. Yep. Cool. Heather, you had a question too? Did I see your hand go up? Okay, sorry. I've got an ice ring question. Yeah. Um, do you know if there are any talks or plans to modify the arriving dressed thing as we get into even colder weather? No, I haven't okay. heard anything. Yeah. Okay. That's going to get a little brutal, I think, in a few weeks and later this week. Yeah. It's going to be a little harsh. Uh, any other questions? All right, let's move on to our discussion items. Roundup program. So we have a yeah, special yeah. guest for that tonight. Yeah, I Welcome, can introduce Brianna. Um, Brianna Rogers. She's uh, one of our interpretive naturalists at Woodlake Nature Center. 
And um, one of the things we've been working on um, together is determining what is the best inclusive wheelchair um, for the conditions at Wood Lake. And we see a lot of mud, a lot of snow there, um, but trying to make the uh, opportunities there more inclusive year round for uh, people with dis mobility disabilities. Um, so working with her, Brianna did all the research into the chairs and reached out to um, different people to get their opinions on things. And ultimately we kind of landed on a chair um, that we are now fundraising for at the Roundup program. So I'm just gonna let her tell us all about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Um, I feel like you already did a great introduction. So my next thing I wanted to share with you all, rather than me trying to describe what an all-terrain wheelchair is, is um, the one we're fundraising for is Grit Freedom Chair. And they have an awesome one minute promo video that shows what this chair is capable of doing. And so John is already on it, gonna show this little video here for us. After watching that little video, um, I get really excited just to get outside and start exploring and adventuring. And that is what Woodlake is all about, um, is getting people outside to experience nature. And we feel that no matter your age or ability or your strength, everybody should have access to the outdoors. And our main demographic that comes to Woodlake is the Richfield students. And there are a few wheelchair users that come out and in the summer, our trails are usually flat enough for them to use their own wheelchair, but we wanted them to be able to access nature year round. And so, especially even in the winter and the snow. And um, in the past, what we've done is just kind of transfer the student to a sled and then they're pulled by their attendant. Uh, but that kind of leads to other issues of snow getting in the, in the sled or them being cold or if they need the back support. And I feel like all of us want to be able to do things on their own or, or feel like you belong or like everybody else. So we really want to empower students to be able to be out there with their peers. Um, and so our goal for the Roundup program is to raise money actually for two wheelchairs, one for an adult and one for a child. So this is what people will see as they go to the liquor stores. And the reason why we kind of decided ultimately to go with the Grit Freedom Chair is it was actually developed by MIT engineers. And so you saw in the video that they had that um, upper push lever that they can steer and turn with. And so it's a lot more powerful pushing above than the typical traditional manual wheelchair from below. Um, the wheels are also a lot larger, like a bike, a mountain bike, and they're thicker. And so they're not gonna get stuck as easily or tip. And it comes with a lot of um, things that you can add accessories, but one really nice one is uh, the handle in the back. I don't know if you can see in the picture for an attendant to still push the child or their teacher. Um, and then lastly, the thing that we're most excited about is that Grit just came out with a brand new wheelchair this month for kindergartners through second graders. So a chair that's built just for them, it's not too cumbersome and they can power that themselves. So, um, and after doing research and comparing, we're able to fundraise enough money for two chairs compared to the price of one from some of the other brands that are out there. So we're really excited about this Roundup program. 
And I don't know if anyone else has any questions about the chairs. Yeah, Anne. I like the process would be for somebody who needs the chair to get it when they go to the park. How easy is that going to be? Is that whole mm -hmm. process also going to be accessible? Mm -hmm. That's a really great question. Um, so if our building is still closed, we could definitely maybe set up a way similar to how we're renting out our skis or snowshoes and make that available to somebody. And we could also have a phone number that they could call and we could have that ready to go for them. Um, in a normal year, if a student just comes in a wheelchair, we would let them know it's available and we could easily transfer them to that chair. And we would definitely want to put it on our website that we have an all-train wheelchair accessible to the public. So when they come, it's there for them to use for free if it's not currently in use. And, um, if somebody at Wood Lake is transferring, is are there insurance questions with that or, or issues? I know there's a certain liability in case it falls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. Um, that's something that maybe I can talk with the city lawyer about just to make sure if there is or not. I know that would like does carry um, liability just in general and people are out on the trails. Usually in the past, we probably won't be the ones transferring the child. We would leave that up to the attendant or the teacher just because they're trained or they feel more comfortable in that regard. Yeah, Heather. Um, I, I just have a couple questions around. So when looking you know kind of at comparisons and things like that um i would assume that a lot of these are going to have different warranties or possible service plans and things like that um so my curiosity is you know what what's the warranty or the service plan around this and mm -hmm. kind of the you know the the longer term cost so to speak mm -hmm. or and i guess connected to that what's the expected lifetime of this mm -hmm. um knowing that this isn't Maybe not going to get used every single day, but who who really knows? So I know it could vary, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's a great question. With the child wheelchair that just came out, um, I would have to ask him about that. The warranty, I would assume it would be similar to their other ones. I want to say the two-year warranty. I'll have to double check on that one. I know in regards of the maintenance, they the MIT built it similar to a bike, so you could take it to just any um, bike store or repair store, and those parts are pretty easily accessible. Um, and with this one, I don't think we won't have to deal with like taking wheels off or parts to assemble it or get it through the door or anything like that. I think they have a, a pretty long um, life expectancy, but I will look into that. That's a great question. Yeah. The, Joseph? I've, mess uh, I've, I've spoken to this in the past that um, even Dick's Sporting Goods in Ridgefield and some of the other local um, bike shops they have like community based uh ability to help out to do that so mm -hmm. that could be uh, a venue that we could use or a, a resource that we could use to reach out to them because they do kind of like what we do with the the liquor stores is they'll ask for donations and then that goes into uh an account and then they they okay. distribute that through the uh the city so that could be an idea to keep keep an eye on mm -hmm. no that's a really good point and we love pulling other partners in i know that um we were given a quote for what the two wheelchairs would co cost which is the price of one for the other brands i was looking at but if for some reason we didn't um fundraise all that money with the roundup project that would be a great resource to kind of go to and see if we could partner and raise the rest of that money Lisa? So I saw a promo on social media for the Roundup program uh, for the wheelchair. And just the all inclusive wheelchair is cool, but the video is super cool. Mm -hmm. Did the video get out there too, or can it? I think so. I just pulled it right off of their website. And when he had, um, the person I've been working with showed me a picture of the kids' wheelchair, that one wasn't out yet, so I couldn't use that. But he said I could pull any pictures from the website. So I can double check. Uh, make sure that we'd have the right to share that video but yeah i think that's a great idea because there's a lot of positive responses on social media just from that post so maybe right. generate more excitement with that video yep. so i'm glad you like the video <laughs> um yes david um first and foremost i think those are 
terrific pieces of equipment and I have a few questions, but I asked the questions with the intention of asking, is it possible to get two of each, two adult chairs, two, mm -hmm. two youth chairs? I know there's issues with where to put them, where to keep mm -hmm. them, um, but we know with our accessible community, it the, the chairs make a person accessible to a different group, but then mm -hmm. creating a more social environment. If two people could do it together, potentially, who create that accessibility, that's where you potentially take it a step further. And I think there's a time and place for that. But if we are asking the public for, you know, a donation to do that, and I don't know the price, so that could certainly stick or shock folks, but I certainly would be willing to pay for that as well. If that, I, I don't know if that's asking too much of that program, but just want to throw it out for food for food for thought, but do you know of any other similar facilities in the Metro that offer something similar, like this kind of a amenity that you know? Mm -hmm. of? Um, yeah, so I called around um, to a few different parts. I talked with Free Rivers. They have an adaptive program there, and um, they have a few different styles of chairs, and one of the chairs he recommended I was doing research on, and it was twice as expensive, but ultimately it was really for, like, mountain biking trails and at wood like they're pretty flat so i feel like the grit freedom chair would accomplish what we would use it for or the public would use it for um and so they do have a few different styles of chairs and then i called around to a few different state parks and i believe itasca was the only other one that had an altering wheelchair um so i'm not quite sure about other areas in the metro sure. um when i called around to some of the few leagues that do like wheelchair sports they weren't really familiar with all trained ones because they're a different style of chair. Um, but yeah, I think that would be great to kind of do some connections and see how other people funded them. Um, I know talking with Grit, they had some ideas of how to fund some chairs. Um, I love the idea of getting a whole suite of them if we could store them all somewhere. And I, I kind of felt like getting two maybe was already asking too much, but I, I love that idea. I'm not sure how much money is usually generated in the past, but um for two chairs, they kind of quoted us just over $10,000. And that was with some of the basic accessories with like the foot platform and the cushion. Um, so I'm sure you can make these chairs amazing and elaborate, but to be friendly for all users, we're kind of just doing the base model and we could add more accessories. But yeah, I don't know, Amy, if you want to add more to that about getting more chairs. But. Yeah, I, I like that idea. Um, I think looking at the Roundup program for the whole year, I know there's other campaigns we're interested in. Yeah. Um, I do think we'd be open to maybe getting the two chairs, focus on raising the 10000 or so dollars, see how they're used, and yeah. maybe get some feedback. And then if it's like that people love them, we're getting a great response. I think we could do the same campaign this time next year, bring it back to get two more. Um, and I think hopefully that will you know, help uh, encourage people to to round up just knowing that they're getting used and there's a need for them. I love the idea too. I mean, if money was no object, I, I would love to have as many as we could possibly store. Um, I know a later discussion will be um, this time, sometime this year will be a new building at Woodlake. And I do think, you know, that's the kind of stuff we can really think about storage for these type of you know equipment, so we have ample space to to build this type of program. Yeah, Joseph. It'd be kind of cool if we were able to do this. To, I don't want to put people on the spot that are in wheelchairs, but I think sometimes they like to show off their skills and do stuff and show what they can do. If like at the 4th of July parade or, you know, something like that, or like the block party, um, have them rolling around and showing people that this is something that we're doing for the community, that we could maybe collect some extra funds that way too, to maybe get that second set of wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I love all these great ideas of generating ways for chairs. This is awesome. Yeah. Did anyone else have any questions? Yeah, Anne. One more thing. Have we um, let the Richfield Disability Advocacy Group in on this plan to get any input from them or um, 
allow them to sort of hype it with their members? Um, that is a great question. I didn't reach out locally. I went to kind of like the national level and kind of followed up with um, their customer care and service. But I think that's a great idea. So I, I would love their input. Input. I just spoke with a few people who were wheelchair users because I don't have that experience or they had family members who were. But I would love to get maybe their local input because um, they might be the ones using it or their family and friends and probably no other connections and resources. So that's an excellent idea. And I, I know Judy Mo, who kind of oversees our gap, is aware of the Roundup program and what we're doing. Um, I, I don't think we reached out to our gap specifically, but I know she knows we're we're doing this. For what it's worth, she's excited about it too. So good, good, here too. Okay, well, if there's no other questions, thank you so much for your time and support in this. And I'm really excited um, for the end of March and see where we're at. So thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Brianna. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, moving on to our Honor and Zoll Veterans Memorial Board. We have another guest for that one. Yeah, I'm super excited to have Leslie Farnham here. Um, she's been helping move the efforts of Have Them Forward the last many years. Um, and, you know, as we get new uh, commissioners on our commission and um, new people involved with the work that we're doing, it's always good to bring everybody along. And I haven't had anyone from Pablo come in the last like year and a half and speak about what is the Honoring All Veterans Memorial? What is the board? Um, what are some of the things that they do? Um, I have realized at a few meetings, we asked if there's any interest in joining our board. And I realized too, there might be people that don't even really know a lot about it. So I wanted Leslie to come and just explain a little bit of the history of the memorial and what the board does and how we may be able to help support them. Because it is a, a, you know, a pretty important part of our park system is our, our veterans memorial. Well, thanks for having me. Um, and yes, I'm Leslie Farnham. I am the outgoing. We just had elections. Our meeting was on Thursday. Um, I'm still involved in going to do this because we're going to, um, we hopefully will be making use of Banchell and doing some other things here this fall um, to help grow the awareness of the memorial. But um, I hope all of you have visited it. Hopefully you've gone on a stroll through Veterans Park um, and stopped at the memorial. Um, but, um, yeah, as we kind of went through and I did with Amy, because the original start of have them, um, over a decade ago, it was through actually several different parts of the commission. Um, the arts commission was looking at, um, bringing more art into the community and how do we evolve and into that. And so that actually kind of the, the base, the, the sculpture in the center actually started with that, um, element and that's. Um, I, I normally I wouldn't always be wearing a hat, but I'm wearing my hat because um, that was a little easier to show than always keeping my shirt. Um, but we started um, with that commission. We've done quite a bit with, you know, the historical society because we are honoring veterans um, and obviously this commission um, and things. And it actually was, you know, we had written in, in in our bylaws and things as we started that we actually had some rep representation from various groups throughout because um, this is a it's all veterans and it isn't just for Richfield. Um, the names on there can come from any veteran alive or deceased so long as they were honorably discharged. Um, but it is, um, it was meant to be um, a shining element of Richfield. So all of us and all of our community um, and, and really honor and, and Veterans Park because we had Veterans Park and it was kind of named that because it was next to the Legion. But to really bring in an element that truly um, honored the veterans that were involved um, in serving our country. And so um, over a decade ago, um, it started with that. And like I said, with the center art piece and the most historic veteran we had in Richfield and Richfield is, I mean, the time of the homes in this, this is a post-war, you know, that was the buildup of Richfield, a lot of veterans, a lot of veterans in this community. Um, so definitely proud to honor them and, and pay homage and respect to them. 
Um, but the most notable again was Chuck Lindbergh um, and not the, you know, not the pilot, um, but Chuck when you go in and, and see him um, and, and it was Chuck's vision and I live on James Avenue and he lived just down the way he was down a little bit. Um, and I always kind of different people that if you, you do, you buzz by Crosstown and, and 35, right? We're Crosstown and 35 met, meet. Um, and his house was just tucked back there. And I'm like, how many people have buzzed in and around the cities and done whatever and had no idea that just on the other side of that sound wall was the most, one of the most famous, you know, military um, individuals in there. Uh, you know, that raising of that flag on, on Iwo Jima um, is, you know, they might, you know, kids, even, you know, school age kids, even still today, they know that picture. They might not know all the details about it, but that picture, the picture of him raising that flag or, and the team, all of them. But as we sat down with Chuck and kind of talked with him, about that and he didn't he was a very very humble man um and that was his you know he was honored himself but he's like don't don't honor me you know i was fortunate to come home so many of them did not make it off that rock as he as he fondly referred to it um and and that he was like we need to honor all we need to honor everyone and everyone that served um, and doing that so that's when it kind of blossomed versus just a statue and, you know, and in, in honor and, and paying tribute to him to becoming. And then that's part with the board of like, okay, well, if we're going to like, you really make a memorial and how do we honor this and how do we develop that? And Travis, you know, worked on, on elaborating the design to become a full memorial um, that, that we did. And when I got on the, I got on the board because my neighbor, um, <laughs> a couple doors down, um, he is now a retired elect. Uh, from the electrical union and things so some of that of you know how do we light it how do we how do we build this how do we you know create this um, and obviously we had to come to the city um, uh, and because we're building it in their park um, and get all those permissions and things like that but it's been an amazing you know I've been a part of it for over a decade myself it's been going for not we're at 12 13 years um but we are, we've kind of hit that point of really wanting to grow and, and expand out and do more many, you know, the first, you know, eight years really was all on construction, just making it a reality. Um, and we were very grateful. Um, you know, we were doing it in phases um, and very honored and grateful that the city did um, make a loan to us so that we could finish the pillars. You know, we had gotten, we had fundraised and done enough to, you know, get get the stone and get the taconite and get Chuck <laughs> there. Um, but as we look and, and to fulfill that, and really now it is to fulfill more of the mission of um, honoring veterans and, and expanding it out to more than just the, the names that are on the tablets. Um, but we will be starting um, a Voices of Our Veterans um, program um, to help honor and spotlight veterans in the community and from all over, not just here in Richfield, but really how do we and let them tell their stories. So much power is in their stories and what they've been through. Um, and so we're excited to get that started um, and do that and, and grow. Um, it is, um, you know, a, an area that we know and something that, and as, I, as we have our meetings and as a board, we're all volunteered, just like, you know, we're all, um, um, volunteer and um, you, we meet once a month. Um, we would love to have somebody from this commission just kind of join us um, just because kind of in that partnership of we are in the city. Um, we have that connection. We have Amy and Chris that are that are on it because obviously we've you know, are in a city park. So we definitely need to keep those things. And, you know, we're insured and things like that. But we're wanting to grow um, the awareness um, and do that. You know, we're always um, the laying of the wreath um, that the 4th of July committee does at it and, and pays homage. The Veterans Day ceremony that we do, the Memorial Day ceremony that we do. Um, we're normally at Penn Fest and just trying to get involved um, a little bit more in the community and kind of spread awareness and about veterans um, and doing that. So that's a little bit about us. I don't know if you have questions um, our, about our board or 
or things like that. But yeah, we're just like you all, we're always looking for extra hands, extra voices. Um, and you do not have to be a veteran to be on the board. You just have to have a good heart and a good passion for them. Anything else you want me to cover, Amy? <laughs> no, that, that's really helpful. I just wanted everyone to kind of understand the history of that memorial and uh, really the need, hopefully, for, for someone in our group here to, to try to join if they can. It would be great. Um, I know everyone has a lot of commitments and is busy, um, but yeah, it's, it's one, one night a month. For, uh, I think you, we meet at 530. Yep, 5.30 on the second Thursday of the month. And normally it's about an hour. We keep them kind of, um, we're fun. We're laid back, and you guys are not on that. We're a laid back, fun group. Um, uh, not, nothing on you gentlemen, Joseph and, and David and things. Um, but there's Deb and I, and then Amy, I was glad. Not that it wasn't as as we love Jim and as he retired, but I was like, yay, another girl, another woman. Um, and then it wasn't because it was Deb and I kind of holding the fort down after the ladies and of the group um but it's um but we have a ton of fun um and it you know it's you know just input and how do we honor veterans you know how do we um promote and and do that um and just kind of keeping that and in our events and you know we just have the two official formal events uh, the year the memorial day is a much larger grander event um and reed bornholt and reed used to sit on this committee um and that was why, because even at that, as I did with Amy, I'm like, actually, in our bylaws, it says that someone from this committee is supposed to be on our um, board. Um, and so I'm like, well, we need to maybe address that um, and look at that. Um, but yeah, that, you know, when I can, and it's on, you know, where the city website and John does a great job, um, Evans, um, you know, in helping support us and, and doing that. Um, but it is, but your involvement and in, in your promotion of the city and what you all do um, in our community efforts. And we we view ourselves, um, you know, as a as a gift to the community. You know, we're you know, we're trying to pay it off and and, and we do we want to add more benches and, and fundraise some of our, you know, those ends um and, and do those things. But um really it's a jewel and a gem for the city it honors all veterans and we want to expand that out and that's part of our growth um but we want to make sure that it's um, well appreciated and and we do feel it the the city and the community and things but we know as, as new folks kind of come in and get involved they might not realize because you drive by and see it and so so many people do they just think that it's a city think because it's in a city park they think that it's you know a city monument or things like that and um it's a bunch of volunteers making it happen <laughs> and and go and and doing that but then i'd also ask too um like i said as we're getting this voices of veterans going um arland um I'll, we'll set up a time and get him interviewed and in doing that but that'll be even part like if you know of folks that would be willing to be interviewed and and share their story um, and sit down with me and have a fireside chat um, in the community center. And, um, you know, we want, we would like to release one once a month um, and help people um, hear those st stories. I think family members um, later on will treasure those um, as well as, you know, currently now, but our city and our community um, and just honoring them, honoring individuals. So, yeah. And thank you all for the work that you do, by the way. And several of you I know personally from other things. Oh, and Brianna's still on, not on her end, but if you need one, I work in healthcare and we run and run my group runs the pines. So not right across from you, but across from the <laughs> VFW. So if you're looking for um, elders that maybe would like to help and fundraise, I would talk to Gramercy, the Pines, Village Shorts, any of those, because we have lots of senior citizens that are wheelchair bound that would be apt to help you and maybe help you fundraise. So I'll slide in on the wheelchair end too, because <laughs> I, work, I work in healthcare <laughs> and I do scout. So if you're looking for people to fundraise, it might be a good scout project. You're connected to a lot of, a lot of great community stop lessons. Thank yeah. you. Great idea. Thank you. You're welcome. But yeah, thank you all for having me. Any questions? Mine's not, it, yours was more elaborate, Brianna, on what they're doing to support you, but any questions on my end? Yeah, Joseph. 
So how do we know if if we would like to add somebody to the wall? What's the process for that? All right, easy peasy. Oh, let me get it to we're gonna go. Hopefully it's sharing. Voila. All right. <laughs> so we're on the city page. So if you just look up Veterans Memorial Richfield, if you Google it, um, we are on the city page. And often you actually see our picture. This is the memorial. Like I said, hopefully you've all strolling through. Um, and uh, there's Chuck. And the flamethrower. And just so you know, he was actually the model for the little army men for the flamethrower. When he got back, they they used him um, to sculpt the little the little green army men that kids play with. Um, but right on the memorial, um, and you watch a video from that year. But we do have there's their sponsor vet and visiting um, that you can fill it out right online. It actually goes to the community center and. John Evans actually gathers them all. Um, we put them on twice a year. Um, Memorial Day and Veterans Day are when the, um, the engravings are put on. Um, so the deadline, um, John, you might even need to help me just a little bit. So Memorial Day, I want to say it's like March 15th. Uh, yep, pretty so, close. April 1st for Memorial Day. Oh, and, there we go. Okay. And August 1st, we'll get an engraving on by Veterans Day that fall. There we go. Because we need enough time to get it, John, to get them listed, get them to the engraver, get them, they lay them out, um, get it back. We send it back to a family member to make sure that it's proofed. Yes, um, exactly. All that good stuff. So, yep. Yeah, so have it into us. Um, but you can do it right online. We do have paper forms too. Um, and you can pay right online. Um, we do have a sponsor vet program. This is part of ours where we help fundraise for um, um, for individuals that, and, and you do need to explain to us, write a letter and explain why you're not able to pay the full um, $400 for the engraving. Um, but we do, we know that there are folks on limited income. A lot of veterans and folks that want to do this are of mature nature and maybe on a more fixed income. Um, and so we do have, we fundraise um, partially to help sponsor and pay up to half of a, an engraving you can get um, um, covered for. And so um, that's some of the fundraising we do is to help cover that cost. Um, but great question. And again, living or <laughs> that's always mine because I do. I have my husband is very much alive and I have his name on there and his uh, grandfather is on there and he's very much not alive um, as a Marine. And we're putting another, I'm, I'm putting in, I, you know, and I've paid fully for mine um, and we're putting another, um, another family member on um, for this Memorial Day. So great question. Anything else? Otherwise I'll let you get back to your meeting. And here, I got to get back in and remember how to stop share on this version. I, I normally, I, I do this a lot for my work, so. <laughs> well, thank you, Leslie. This is great. You are welcome. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks, Leslie. And I can follow up with everybody um, you know, next month and just see if, if anyone has any interest to join their board, you know, just reach out to me in the next month um, or else I'll circle back and, and just see if, if anyone's interested now that hopefully everyone knows a little bit more about the, the organization. Well, next month also is when we'll be doing, redoing our uh, liaison appointment. So it'll be mm -hmm. a good time to go back to that. Yeah. And hopefully easier to get a volunteer for that one now that we know more about it. Yeah. Yep. All right. So Amy, you're up with the community center feasibility study. Yeah, I wanted to add this to our discussion items because it's something that I'm sure a lot of people have seen on social media. Um, it was in the Star Tribune today, if you get the paper. And since it's you know related to the work that that we do on the commission, I wanted just to bring everybody up to speed. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you know the American Legion right by the Veterans Memorial. 
um, is going to be selling their property. Um, I think they're looking at selling it for $3.4 million. It's about four acres and it's adjacent to our veterans park complex. And in understanding that it's going to come for sale, um, you know, they're potentially, we're not sure at the time, what, is there any opportunity for the city to purchase the land um, and add another recreational amenity and, you know, do something for the park? So, and a, a very quick turnaround, you know, we're kind of exploring some options. And one of the um, avenues we were kind of exploring is, would it be a good site and could we afford a community center? Um, and, you know, right now it is zoned high density housing. So for it to be anything else, it will have to be rezoned. And um, the other caveat is that the American Legion would like to have a presence on that parcel of land. So whatever gets built, um, the Legion would probably be part of the development plan of it. Um, so there is a moratorium on the sale and the Legion is working towards um, you know, attracting developers and hopefully looking at different proposals as to what could be done. Simultaneously, the city is doing a small area study of of what um, what are some of the design structures that should be in place for whatever gets built there, just so it is in sync with the park campus around it, the memorial, Veterans Park itself, the ice rink, pool. Um, so. And putting those different structures in place, you know, they'll look at the height of a build, building, the color, the aesthetic, how far would it be set back from the street, the memorial, kind of all those guidelines in place. And that helps a potential developer in putting in a proposal as to what's actually going to go there. Um, so the small area study is going on. And very quickly, um, we wanted to see is it feasible to have a community center? So we did quite a bit of research in a short amount of time with uh, other cities across the Metro and even greater Minnesota and looking at primarily the costs that are involved with construction and then also operation costs of a community center. And we did a lot of um, kind of number crunching of kind of a smaller scale community center medium and then a large one that would include indoor aquatics. And, you know, it would impact residents, um, you know, in a pretty major way with with um, the annual taxes. And we feel like at this time, you know, our recommendation to the council is that it would be cost prohibited. Um, but we did, you know, have a, a very, um, I think robust discussion last week about really all the great needs that a community center can fulfill and the gaps in our recreation um, system and program that we have, and how can these still be addressed? So like right now in the short and medium term, we can't build a community center, but how can we continue to try to like, assess and address these needs? And I, I did a presentation last week, and maybe some of you have seen the presentation, but I could share a couple slides just to show you um, some of the, items that we discussed. Um, so we, we did discuss with the council kind of the historical background and the community center, as John pointed out to me today, is turning 60 this year. We have a lot of big birthdays in our park system this year. The pool's turning 60, the community 60, and Woodlake 50. So lots of big birthdays. Um, and, you know, just this talks a little bit about the history built in 1961. We don't have a formal space for, you know, like indoor athletics or fitness, um, but we do use the space well that we have for, for community meetings, dance, um, exercise. There was a referendum for a community center in 1999. Uh, it did not pass. It lost um, a four to one ratio. And that was for a proposed community center um, on the west side of Veterans Park that did include a pool, uh, fitness equipment, offices. And right now in our parks master plan that um, we prepared several years ago, it is listed as a future priority and is something that the community 
you know, desires. And maybe some of you took the community survey that was done last year, but it does show that the majority of residents feel like the um, recreational opportunities are excellent or good in the city. And a new nature center building and a community center are generally supported um, by residents, and that would include supporting a tax increase, a property tax increase for one of those amenities. Um, and this just kind of talks about some of the, the considerations that other communities noted that we need to think through in, in deciding if it's feasible, um, and that most community centers don't make money, uh, they need to be subsidized, the recovery is only about 60%, so you need to subsidize the other 40%, um, and just understanding how it may affect private businesses. Um, one issue with that of land, maybe it, I'm not sure ultimately what what could have been, but the parking would have been pretty tight probably from the get go. Because if you have a huge facility, you need a lot of parking, particularly if you're going to be sharing it with um, the Legion too. And you know, there's lots of costs associated with building a community center. Um, and one of the things that became abundantly clear with how high the cost is, it really would put in jeopardy a lot of the other prioritized projects for the city, um, such as the 65th road construction. Um, other road projects are pretty important, and in, we need to be reinvesting in a lot of our underground like sewer system and, and piping. Um, there's other recreation projects as well. Um, but it does, of course, fill a lot of needs and they are awesome. You know, they, a lot of times a modern day community center will have banquet, community space, facilities, fitness, rec program space, indoor play area. Right now, a really popular would be indoor sport courts like tennis and pickleball, year round aquatics. And these are all, a lot of these things are gaps right now in our park system. Um, so in looking forward, really trying to figure out how can we um, fill some of these gaps in kind of creative ways. Um, one way would be potentially to do a facilities assessment across the city and look at public and private and understand you know, what, what we have across the board and how can we partner and leverage and make sure um, we're able to fill some of these gaps. Potentially rebranding the community center to be more multi-generational. And we kind of discussed by default, I think, because the building is um, quite accessible to, to all generations that I think by default, people sometimes will call it the senior center. Um, but looking at our facilities, that one is the best suited for senior programming. But we definitely could bring in programming for other ages. Um, we are, you know, a top priority for the city is looking at constructing a new nature center building and looking at a design of a potential nature center would include a banquet space and meeting rooms. And also we can hopefully do indoor athletics at the Ridgefield Ice Arena now that we can include in our annual calendar dry floor events. So we could potentially do pickleball, um, lacrosse, soccer, some indoor sports when we take out the ice for certain amount of time each year. Um, so just planning for the future, you know, some of our recommendations were really understanding the effects of the pandemic, though, that uh, that it will have on recreation and fitness facilities. Financially recovering from the pandemic. So the timing right now is, is hard to do any sort of enormous capital project. Um, the timing continued to, to have conversations with potential partners. Um, potentially you know, looking at timing of other work plans and develop a strategic plan to kind of better understand facility locations, programs, and costs. So kind of get into the details if we are able to ever um, do a kind of community center, where would it go? What would it look like? You know, and ultimately, if it's something that we cannot afford, um, gaps, on a little bit longer term and in developing like a strategic plan with those and a financial strategic plan too. 
Um, and looking at some of the costs, you can see kind of a smaller end community center can cost 40 to 50 million, 70 to 80 for middle size one, 80 to 90 for indoor aquatics. And there's a lot of other costs going into the site acquisition and potentially parking. And there's different types of bonds that you can um, purchase to help pay for it. Um, but they all affect the tax levy and that would impact um, how much the city can borrow for other projects such as road projects. And then ultimately, you know, it will impact homeowners and how much it will cost each year in taxes to have uh, a new facility. When we looked at annual operating costs, um, and they can be anywhere from, you know, from over a million dollars to like 800,000 a year, it can be quite expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the amount, the additional amount that would help cover the 40% that needs to be subsidized puts, you know, an additional amount um, that we would need to uh, ask for town taxpayers. Um, you know, we got into some of the socioeconomics of our community and where median household income is at. And this is from the Met Council. When you look at all the other cities in Hennepin County, you can see Richfield, you know, is falling behind with median income. And so the timing is, you know, would, would not be great with the pandemic and, you know, some families struggling to, to raise taxes in any significant way. And, you know, we our poverty, uh, the population that lives at or below the poverty line is going down, but it's still significant. And, you know, again, just being aware of these um, factors when you make the decision is really important. And so some of the considerations we brought forward to the council in making the decision and more recommendations recovering from the pandemic, continuing to assess and address the needs, um, building partnerships to help meet the needs, and hopefully you know, developing a strategic plan that would help us ultimately decide you know, long-term if it's feasible. So in yeah, in discussing it with the the council last week, you know they understood our recommendation and really felt like that that is the best thing for the community right now. It may not be the right parcel in the right time for a community center. So um, that is kind of off the table for the site. And now we're continuing to do the small area study, and the legion is continuing to to move forward you know, and with developers and proposals for that site. And ultimately the small area study, I think we'll have, it, it is hard right now um, not to have that in place. We really feel like ultimately it's very important for the park and the community to have those design structures in place, just so whatever gets built is really in alignment with the park around it. Since it is such a, a sensitive area with a, a wetland, um, and so many different recreational amenities right around there. Mm -hmm. so. so how much building would really be feasible there anyway, considering how difficult it was just to build the band shell? And granted, the Legion property is further away from the marsh. Mm -hmm. But I remember that being a big issue with the band shell, getting the pilings deep enough to find stable ground. Yeah. And that's that's definitely, you know, whatever goes in there, I, I do think the soil abatement can be quite expensive. And what they had to do for the band shell was really dig out the, the junky soil and bring in better soil that you could build on top of. And that can be pretty expensive to amend soil. Um, so I, I'm not sure, but I, I'm guessing there'll probably have to be some part of that done or whatever right. goes in there. Mm -hmm. And then looking at, yeah, you know, considering what we have available with all of our assets throughout the park system here and the variety of needs have been expressed, 
could we do some sort of um, community meetings, assessments, bring people in, let's talk about what we have, what would we like to see, and look at what can we do. Like we somehow add to our our capital improvement plan that we do every year, mm -hmm. and have a, a different you know pool of money that we use for these types of things. Uh, what that becomes, we have to determine based on assessments. But with the tourism board, we're doing a tourism tourism assessment program with the U, where we've had community meetings have been cut short because of or the plans been cut short because of COVID. But we're rolling along, bringing groups in and talking about all of the the tourism assets we have here. And the next step, and how can we bridge those gaps? Mm -hmm. So something similar with this type of stuff. You know, could we take a one of our park buildings? I know most of them aren't in great shape right now, but could we do some work and make that a you know play center for preschool age kids, uh, their you know, caregivers to come on Tuesday at 10 a.m. and have a group play time, mm -hmm. or you know, one of the the larger buildings refit it to work as a meeting space and open those things up a little bit and just find ways to get more use out of the things that we have. I know mm -hmm. the costs associated with that too, yeah, but far less than a new community center. Yeah, and that's kind of one of the recommendations is to really look at what we have and be creative with it. Um, and I think some of the facilities, like you're saying, Lisa, would have to be reinvested in to right. bring them up to, to speed. But I do think it would be a lot more cost effective than you know, building new, um, you know, and I think we've, I do think that, yes, we could definitely um, do an assessment. And I think that's kind of the first step in looking at what we have, how can we address the needs? I think we could love leverage our partnerships a little better too um, with some of our partners in town, both private and public and in utilizing each other's facilities for the community and you know, getting creative. I know Chris and I were just talking, um, you know, we could turn on the radio and with the renovations, people can walk around rink one and just walk wraps and listen to the music. We could have a walking program where we wouldn't even need a track. Um, you know, just getting creative. Yeah. With what we have. And I, I agree with you that we could use some of the facilities more. How can this group help with that? Well, I think what the city manager would like to do is and, and myself is probably have an outside consultant help do the assessment and then come back probably with to a group like us with the recommendations and then we'll need to try to prioritize them and which ones we we can financially plan for with the budget that we have could we also bring in a it has some community meetings bring mm -hmm. residents in to talk about what they want. Sure. Yep. We could do community meetings. Yeah, I think I think that sounds like an awesome idea. And I've thought, you know, and I do think that in e even just these last like five years, we've come a really long way with the programming that we offer, which is awesome to see. But I know, you know, back then at that point i i know that i struggled to be able to do some programs locally wanting to support richfield but not really finding you know what i what i wanted and i think that was kind of around the time we partnered with bloomington so there was a lot of change happening but i would love to see you know even more um obviously COVID has stopped a lot of things but there were some really great you know toddler kinds of programs and things like that that were starting i think it was hard to gain some traction with that stuff but um but I'd love to be be seeing more of that and, and helping with what I can because yeah, there's mm -hmm. just so much so much to do and a lot of families here and a lot of people who do want to be involved. So yeah, I like the idea of, of doing maybe like an open house and mm -hmm. um, yeah. figuring out how to do breakout rooms. Maybe we can have people you know, join a room if they have for certain types of recreation and just provide feedback. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that idea. That yeah. sounds good. Yeah, I think, um, to like looking at priorities, one of the questions that came up um, 
you know, with some of our bigger projects in recreation, definitely one we got done, um, you know, right now is the ice arena project mm -hmm. and knowing that we had to do the renovation with the R22 getting phased out. Um, but another one that's really bubbled up to the top is Woodlake Nature Center. And so we are drafting another bill right now um, that will go to the legislature this year, a bonding bill for a new building. And, you know, to get that done, you know, we're still trying to figure out financially all the pieces of how to get there um, and how that impacts everything else, too. And I, I think the pool is another large, you know, capital project that is 60 years old. We have the original pool liner. Um, Chris and a lot of the other managers that we had have done a, a tremendous job keeping it up and kind of band-aiding it. Um, but it does need a, a new liner eventually. And so just financially planning for that and some aquatic improvements, um, it might be the right time. We'll have to look at the price tag to to upgrade some things and do some renovations there. But definitely Wood Lake and the pool are at the top because they just, they can't wait much longer. Like both of them are getting into, you know, some kind of tough shapes where I could go on for a while about the condition of Wood Lake um, and the pools and uh, definitely in kind of tough shape from not being open last summer. It took some wear and tear from the sun actually and cracking yeah. and bubbling. So yeah, we'll have to, you know, definitely financially look at priorities and kind of mm -hmm. figure out how to how to do as much as we possibly can. Yeah. Yeah. And I think oh, oh, go ahead. sorry. Go ahead there. Sorry. I was just gonna say I think that kind of to Lisa's point here too. Um, like one thing that she mentioned with, you know, having an open play or something like that, I think there are things like that, that um, might be, I know there's probably some liability and things like that, that we would need to look into, but there may be some things we can look at doing for small fees and maybe look at, you know, at least not losing, at least not losing money on these things, you know, um, but I know as a parent of two small kids, I mean, right now it's tough, but, you know, as a parent of two small kids, that kind of stuff is, is worth, is valuable to me. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, but even just kind of being able to participate in my own community is also something that's, you know, a priority. So, you know, even if it's like an outdoor treasure hunts or things like that and, 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 and stuff, you know, I'm, I would think that we can kind of, um, yeah, maybe find some, some decently, um, profitable and really beneficial and fun things. So mm -hmm. we could discuss that if we need and also what types of things people want to do. Mm -hmm. Joe, you had a question or a comment? I was just about to mimic what Heather said. Um, you know, it's, it's, I don't have kids, but when I see events, like, I think it was two years ago, you had the zip line down at Taft Park and stuff. It got me to go out and, and visit the parks and just, you know, have fun. I grabbed my fishing pole and I went out there and I fished for a bit and just got out. So outsourcing stuff like that. I mean, for, we have a gym at at the hockey arena, right? Do we do we get any revenue out of that? We do, yeah. Yep. Okay. And then it, the space is kind of leased to the, it, you know, a private business, so the space is leased to them, but like they okay. rent from us. Yep. And then could we do anything like you were saying, like an indoor area? Um, could we work anything out with like Holy Angels to mm -hmm. rent out that space? Um, and they're, you know, they have that indoor uh, stadium. Mm -hmm. um, I used to work for a company called Ninja Anywhere, where they would have actually like a semi truck that would come in and it would fold out and it'd be like a Ninja Warrior course. You know, you could do something like that and make it like an annual thing where, you know, 
and that would help with tourism or, you know, I don't know. It's like the eel pulp thing up north, you know. I don't know if you guys know about that. But, you know, just find something unique um, to draw people into Richfield. Um, you know, like the indoor pool stuff. I mean, we have Gray Wolf right across the street. Um, there's hotels around. If people want to do that, I think they can probably find it along with the schools around our area mm -hmm. um, where we wouldn't need to build and put a bit, a large expense into a new pool in a community center, uh, in my opinion. But, uh, you know, those are just a couple ideas of, you know, we do a really good job with the, you know, the 4th of July and the, the Penn Street parade and stuff. But, you know, I, I just think that, you know, instead of building out these large area, you know, these large uh, facilities, just taking advantage of what we have, doing some upkeep and just making something cool about that specific structure. Yep. I agree. I mean, we continue to work with our partners. Um, I don't think our staff can take one more event. I will be honest, like we have a huge event every season. I have a very small staff, um, so I don't think we want one more event. I think we can add to events perhaps that where we already are there doing things. Um, but yes, I, I totally agree with you with Holy Angels. I mean, they have a lovely sports dome. And, you know, is there some room there for some part there? You know, that's something to explore. Definitely. Any other questions or comments? And I can follow up with you, Lisa, about the idea of having like a recreation open house. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. So then moving on to action items, we don't have any. And then committee reports. Transportation, Kevin is not here. Foul board, Stephanie, anything from the foul board? No, there wasn't. Um, they're having a meeting on this, this, yeah, this Thursday. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're gonna find that most commissions didn't meet in December. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so planning, David, anything from them? I haven't seen an agenda or a meeting since October. Looks like the last one. All right. Arts, Amy, anything from them? No, they haven't met for since October. Okay. Friendship City, Amy. <laughs> they also um, have moved to quarterly meetings instead okay. of monthly. Um, so no. Sustainability, Heather. Um, so they, they were kind of flipped because they, they did meet in December. But it ended up being the same week as as this, and so it was before our last one. But now it's switched to being after. If any of this makes sense to you guys, mm -hmm. I don't yeah. quite know what I said there. Um, so their meeting is in, I believe, next week. So I'll have some info um, for you then, hopefully. All right. That gets us to the end. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, Heather. Yeah. yeah. Hi. I just wanted to do a quick recap. I think most of you probably have already seen some of this stuff, but I know a couple of you guys also did volunteer to be drop off locations for the food drive. So that seems long ago, because actually it was just about a month ago that it ended, but um, it was a bit of a whirlwind. Um, Amy and John and um, Bonnie, I believe, um, were super helpful and just awesome on gathering all the the stuff that we needed but um we didn't really set a set a formal goal and i think for for me i kind of was like none of us really <laughs> knew what to shoot for veep kind of loosely recommended 3000 on that ballpark but we actually raised about uh over 4000 pounds of food um plus uh, I want to say $100 in gift cards. We we got 4,060 pounds of food. And and it was actually really funny because my, my car was insanely packed full and probably somewhat dangerously 
packed the city truck as well. But um, and then we had to go back for more. So it went really well. It was super successful. Um, I think that like this team just did an awesome job of like brainstorming on very short notice um when we talked about it at our last meeting. Um so I want to say thanks to all of you guys and Joe, you had an awesome, you know, mention about what you had done before with your yard. And that kind of was a great thank you. Yeah, Amy sharing some pictures. And that was just really um a great jumping off point for us to 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 use. So thank you for that. Um, but I'm really excited. I think we just did an awesome job. I'm really proud of Richfield. Everybody just really got excited about it and and it was awesome to see. And when Bonnie and I went to Veep and did the drop off and all of that, I I I swear to I swear to you guys, we both guessed closer to like two thousand pounds at the end, just to see who'd be closer. And the guy was like, No, you guys had like four thousand and sixty pounds, and we were just floored. Wow. So Yay. It was awesome. I'm hoping we can keep doing it. I think it'd be cool to do annually or even, you know, if there's other times of the year where they have a high need. So I think, yeah, it was really awesome. That's cool. 5,000 yeah. pounds next year. That's right. That's right. <laughs> We've got goals. And we also collect other items like diapers or mm -hmm. feminine products, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, there was a whole lot of stuff. Yeah, I mean, it was really cool to see. A lot of it was being one of the people who lifted it. A lot of it was very heavy. Um, yeah. But um, but yeah, there was there were quite a bit of of toiletries in there as well, which was really nice to see. And I think you know this was obviously much shorter notice, but a great experience. And and hopefully going forward, we can do this kind of thing again. You know, even without COVID, I think. For certain reasons, it just made it a little bit easier for some people to drop stuff off, um, knowing that there's, you know, this neighbor on the corner or this house they drive past and and that kind of thing. And then I think that people did a great job, too, of of posting and and, you know, sharing and things like that on local, you know, Facebook pages and groups and things like that. I think that really helped. And actually somewhat one woman from one of the liquor stores had mentioned to us she was she was surprised that it collected anything because she was like we've done food drives for other places before and nothing really ever gets collected but but mm -hmm. you know their basket was full and and then there was more stuff to the side of it so cool. so yeah i don't know what we did right but we did some stuff right so it was pretty exciting well you may not know this about me when my youngest was born um, with a disability, um, I was not able to go back to work and my family took a huge hit because we lost half our income because I couldn't go back to my job because yeah. full-time care. And Veep was there for me when I wasn't sure how I was going to feed my family. Mm -hmm. And it was a very short period, thankfully, and I'm in a good place now. But there was that time that I had to walk into a food bank and ask somebody to help feed my family. Mm -hmm. So this is so important. I can't tell you how much it means when you walk in there and they're like, grab a basket, you're going home with groceries. I yeah. mean, it's, it's huge. And it's, mm -hmm. it's one of those experiences that, that people don't want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of stigma attached. Um, and Veep is such a great organization for making everybody feel very human and respected. So I'm, I'm so proud of you and all of that work and proud of Richfield. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. That's so nice to hear. And I think, you know, right now there's just so many people, you know, who do need, who need some help, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so um, I'm, I'm thinking and, and hoping that that was maybe a reason that a lot of people did seem to push um, and, and, and come out and really show up. It just, it really made me, I mean, I'm already proud of the city, but it just really made me happy. So. Mm -hmm. Good job, Heather. Yeah, Joe. So it's it it doesn't have to be like, I mean, I love what we were able to accomplish there. Um, that was awesome. Um, but it's just as easy as just sending more of a generic message of sharing, right? So you have people with the mini libraries out there right now on my front lawn, um, I have board games for kids to take on their, you know, the, on their walk home from school. 
you know, it's like any of that stuff. If we can just promote generically, not just, I mean, food obviously is the most important and toiletries and, and, you know, necessities, but, um, and I don't want it to turn out to a, you know, a, a landfill in front of your front yard, but as you know, as long as it's like promoted well, or, you know, if we could put a message out that way, just to plant a seed in everybody's mm -hmm. mind on how we could do that. Um, you know, it's as easy as me throwing a clear rubber made container out front with some board games so they can see what's in there. They can grab it and go, you know, it, there's none of that, what you were talking about, and it's like, you don't have to worry about somebody judging you or anything. You just grab a game and you go, you know, mm -hmm. it's just fun. So I just want to throw that out there to see if anybody had any additional ideas on that. I've or seen some great... <laughs> That's yeah, I like that. Yeah, I think and going off of that, there's there been I've seen some free little pantries and things like that, but um, even stuff like like you have said and the, the swap idea, I mean, it's hard right now for a lot of people, you know, and I know my kids are bored of all of of all the toys in my house for some reason. And you know, so yeah. Well, I'm on 74th and Bloomington. You can come pick up some board games. <laughs> we might just. <laughs> You'd be surprised how physical Connect Four gets in this house. <laughs> we don't really follow the rules, but yeah, we might just do that. But yeah, that's a great idea and something I think that, you know, this commission maybe could do some brainstorming on. Mm -hmm. Good idea. All right, anything else? Then I think we are done for tonight and we meet next month, February 16th. At that point, like I said, we'll be uh, electing new chair and vice chair, uh, as well as appointing new liaison. So be thinking about what you wanna do next month when we all get back together. And with that, say we're adjourned. <laughs>